So in this video, we're going to have a look at the different types of discontinuity in calculus and its pure maths foundations real analysis. So a discontinuity is a point where the function is not continuous. So remember, here is the definition of continuity at a point p, that 1, the limit as x approaches p of the function f of x must exist, and 2, it must equal the value of the function at p. So there are different ways in which this can fail, and that gives rise to the different types of discontinuity. So we'll go from simplest to most complicated. So starting with the simplest, the simplest type of discontinuity is called a point discontinuity. And at a point discontinuity, the limit as x approaches p of f of x is going to exist, but it's not going to equal the value of the function at the point p. So a picture of a point discontinuity is something like this. So here is our graphical representation of our function, and here it has a hole. This is the point p, where there is a point discontinuity. And you can see that the, the limit as x approaches p is going to be the value that you would expect it to be, i.e. it's going to be where that hole is in the graph. But the value of the function at p is down here. So it's as though I've snatched it out from there and then put it down here. So when that happens at a point p, we say that there is a point discontinuity at the point p. There is another name that people use for this type of discontinuity, and it's a removable discontinuity. And the reason that it's called that is because you can imagine fixing this and making the function continuous at the point p. All you would have to do is redefine what the value of the function is here. Say, it's no longer this thing down here. Instead, ask what is the value of the limit as x approaches p of f of x, it's that value, and redefine the value of the function to be equal to that limit, so that what the function is approaching is going to be the value of the function at that point p. So you can fix it, and for that reason we call it a removable discontinuity. And you can fix it very simply. So the next type of discontinuity is slightly more complicated, but it's still very simple. So it's called a jump discontinuity, and in this case, the limit as x approaches p of f of x is no longer going to exist. However, the second best thing is true, that the right-hand limit of the function as x approaches p and the left-hand limit are both going to exist. However, they're not going to equal one another. Of course, if they equaled one another, then the overall limit would exist. So here's a picture of what this graphically looks like. So this is our function, and this is the point p here where there is a jump discontinuity. And you can see that the left-hand limit of this function is going to be this value here. So as you get closer and closer to p from the left, you're going to approach a value something like this. Uh, but the right-hand limit is going to be totally different. As you approach p from the right-hand side, you're approaching this sort of value, so something totally different. So they're both going to exist, but they're going to be different to one another. The value of the function doesn't actually really matter at the point p. It's not going to change what the right and left-hand limits are. But in the case of this picture, I've attached it to the right-hand side of the function here, and we've got a hole here. So hopefully you can appreciate why this is called a jump discontinuity. It's because if you were plotting this function, drawing it with a pen, you draw this side, and then you'd get closer and closer to the point P, and then as you get to P, you're going to have to take your pen off the piece of paper, and you're going to have to jump up to here, and then you can continue on plotting it continuously. So the third type of discontinuity is called an infinite discontinuity, and in this case, both the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit are going to exist. However, one or both of them is infinite either infinity or negative infinity. So we're expanding our definition for the limit of a function from just the epsilon delta definition for a finite limit to include the definition for the limit of a function being infinity or negative infinity. So a beautiful example of an infinite discontinuity is the function 1 over x at the point 0. Here, if you look at the left-hand limit, it's going to negative infinity, and if you look at the right-hand limit, it's going to positive infinity. So this is an example of an infinite discontinuity. So now things get complicated. So this is the end of the simple types of discontinuity. So we group these three types, removable, jump, and infinite discontinuities together, and we can call them the simple types of discontinuities. Another name is discontinuities of the first kind, or discontinuities of the first type. And the discontinuities that we're going to look at now, these much more complicated types, they are then called discontinuities of the second kind.
So discontinuities of the second kind then. So if a function has a discontinuity of the second kind, it is more complicated than if it has a discontinuity of the first kind. Generally, functions with discontinuities of the second kind are in the realm of analysis rather than calculus, whereas these types of discontinuity, they can crop up in calculus courses. So the definition then for a discontinuity of the second kind, in this case, one or both of the right and left hand limits for the function as x approaches p is not going to exist. So from at least one side, it's not going to be true to say that the function is approaching anything at all. So I'm going to show you an example of a famous function that actually has discontinuities of the second kind everywhere on its domain, which is the entire real line. And this is called the Dirichlet function. So it's a function that's defined from the real line into the real line, and it's defined by this rule. So f of x is going to equal 1 if x is a rational number, and 0 if x is an irrational number. So it's quite a difficult function to plot. It actually looks like two solid lines, like so, because all the rational numbers, and there are infinitely many of them, but only countably infinitely many of them, are all going to be plotted onto one. So this is the sort of line that's going to form from them all being plotted. Of course, there are loads and loads of holes in that line for all the irrational numbers, but because there's an infinite number of them, um, it's going to look like a solid line when you zoom out. And then here is another line, which is where all of the irrational numbers are being plotted to, so they're all being plotted onto zero. And again, there are holes in this line, which is where the rational numbers are, but there's then uncountably infinitely many points that are being mapped onto this zero for all the rational numbers, or the irrational numbers, rather. So in the case of this function, every single point in the real line is a point where there is a discontinuity of the second kind. So for all p is an element of the real line, it's actually true that both the right and left hand limits do not exist, but we only need one of them not to exist in order for us to be able to call it a discontinuity of the second kind. So we'll take the left hand one. So limit as x approaches p from the left of f of x does not exist. The reason it's not going to exist is if you consider your point p here, and you consider getting closer and closer to p from the left hand side, you are always still going to come across rationals and irrationals. If you consider a tiny little interval around p, so I've magnified it up here, so we've got this interval p minus delta to p plus delta, whatever delta you pick, as long as delta is greater than zero, even if it's absolutely minuscule, inside this interval here, to the left part here, in this gap between this bit and p, there are still going to be rational numbers and irrational numbers there. So the function is still going to be jumping from 1 to 0, 1 to 0. And that is true no matter how indefinitely close you get to p. So you're always going to continually be jumping between 1 and 0 as you tail into p from the left-hand side. So you can't therefore converge to either of them. You can't converge to anything. You can't get and stay indefinitely close to anything. So there is a claim there that needs a little bit more explaining. How do I know that this is always going to have rational numbers and irrational numbers inside of it? So I've taken that bit of the interval that we're interested in, the bit from p minus delta to p, the left side of the interval, down here. And I want to now explain why this interval is always going to have rational and irrational numbers inside of it for all delta greater than zero. So let's start with the explanation as to why there must always be a rational inside this interval. So you can always find a rational that is below the lower boundary of the interval, so to the left of the interval, and you can always find a rational that is above the upper boundary of the interval. That is effectively the Archimedean property because you can always find integers that will satisfy these things, and integers are rationals. So the Archimedean property says that you can always find a natural number that is bigger than any real number. So this in real number p will have a natural number that is bigger than it. Now the Archimedean property of course works in the other direction as well for the negative integers. So you're always going to be able to find an integer that is lower than this real number p minus delta. So yes, we can find rationals that are on these two sides. We'll call this rational here a and this rational here b. What we can now do is do an iterative process to find a rational that is going to be 
inside this interval. And actually, in this case, it's really simple in the case of this picture. But in general, you might have to do this a few more times. So the way you're going to do it is you're just going to bisect. You're going to go halfway in between A and B. And to do that, you just add A to B and divide by 2. And of course, A plus B divided by 2. If A and B are rationals, then A plus B over 2 is going to be irrational. So this midpoint is going to be irrational. And bingo, in the case of our picture, that's straight in the interval. So you, in general, what you do is you find this midpoint and you'd ask, is this inside the interval? If it is, bingo. If it's not, ask, is it above the interval or is it below the interval? If it's below the interval, it replaces the A. Get rid of the A and now make this new midpoint your lower boundary. If it's above the interval, then get rid of B and make it your new upper boundary. So let's say, in general, that this had been above uh, the interval, so it replaced B, then we'd now be considering this interval from A to here, and we'd have our interval of interest, P minus delta to P, somewhere in between these two. So you'd, all, you're always trying to keep your interval inside these two rational points. And then what you'd do is you'd do the same thing again, you'd bisect, and you'd look at that midpoint, and you'd ask, is it in your interval? If it is in your interval, bingo. If it's not in your interval, is it either above the interval or is it below the interval? One of the two must be true. If it's above the interval, then it will replace the rational that is above the interval. If it's below the interval, then it will replace your rational that you've got currently below the interval. And then you'll have a new interval and you'll keep going in this way. You'll bisect each time and you'll get a smaller and smaller uh, gap between your two rationals that have the interval somewhere in the middle between them. So I've drawn a bigger picture here to show what I mean better. So here is A and here is B, and you can see here is the interval P minus delta to P. So I'd start with A and B, and then I'd go halfway in between them. This is not inside the interval, and therefore we look, is it bigger or smaller than the interval? Is it above or below the interval? And it's clearly above the interval, so we'd use this and replace our upper rational with it. So we'd now be looking at A to this, and we'd half them, so we'd add this one to this one and divide by two. And again, we still end up with another rational. So here is that midpoint. And then again, we ask, is it inside the interval? No, it's not. It's above the interval. So it's going to replace our upper rational. So this one is gone, bye-bye. And now we've got this one. And again, each one of these that we create, these new numbers that are replacing our old numbers, they're guaranteed to be rationals because of the way we're forming them by adding the two rationals together and dividing by two. So this new blue point is a rational. And then you'd have the interval from A to this, and you'd half again, and oh bingo, that's then in our interval. So we're guaranteed eventually to end up with a rational that has to be in that interval because each time the distance between our upper rational, sorry, our lower rational and our upper rational is halving. So eventually the distance between them is going to end up smaller than the length of this interval. So it can't possibly not at some point end up inside the interval and then you'll have a rational inside that interval. Now on to the explanation as to why there's always going to be an irrational inside this interval. So we've concluded that there is at least one rational inside this interval. I want now a second rational inside that interval and I can very easily do that. All I need to do is imagine creating an interval inside this interval that's small enough so that it doesn't include the rational that I've already got and then I know that there's going to be a rational inside that interval following the exact same proof that I've already used so I'll then have these two separate rationals inside my interval. So I'm going to call my two rationals x and y here, and x is the smaller one, y is the bigger one. So now what I can do is consider that difference between them. I can consider what is y minus x, so that's that little number there, that little distance, and that's going to be a rational number because y and x are both rational numbers. What I can now do is try and build you a new irrational number that's going to be in here by taking my rational number x and adding on a fraction of this difference, this little distance here, such that the fraction that I add on is going to be less than 1 and is going to be an irrational fraction. Because if I do that, my new number that's going to be inside here will then be an irrational number. So I'm just going to use the square root of 2 over 2. The square root of 2 is roughly 1.4 something something something. So if I divide it by 2, it's then going to be less than 1. It's going to be 0.7 something something something. So if I use this fraction 
multiply it by that distance, which is a rational number, y minus x, and add that onto x, I'll have something that's in between x and y, and is therefore inside this interval. And this thing cannot possibly be rational, because if it was, it would then imply that the square root of 2 was rational, because all the other things are rational. So I've put my new irrational number there in red, in triumph. And just to emphasize again, the reason I can conclude this must be irrational is because if it were rational, then I'd have this is a rational number. What I could then do is subtract x from both sides, and I'd then get that this, this bit that's left on this side, is still a rational number, because it was a rational number minus x, which was a rational number. So a rational number minus a rational number is a rational number. And I can continue on this argument. You know, I can then multiply both sides by 2. That doesn't change the fact that this side is going to be a rational number. I'd then be left with just square root of 2 times this is equal to a rational number. And then I know y minus x is a rational number, so I can divide through by y minus x, and dividing through by that is going to still leave this side being a rational number. So you'd overall conclude that square root of 2 is a rational number, which we know it isn't. So there you go. We've proven that inside this interval there is always going to be rational numbers and irrational numbers, and that holds for all delta greater than 0. So as you get indefinitely close to p, you are always still going to have more rational and irrational numbers in this tail end as you're tailing into p. So your function is always going to be dotting between 0 and 1, 0 and 1. Therefore, it cannot get and stay indefinitely close to either 0 or 1. So it's not going to have a limit as x approaches p, and that's going to hold true for all p. So there you go, the Dirichlet function, an example of a function that's discontinuous everywhere, and the discontinuities are of the second kind. So with that, we'll end the video. Thank you for watching.